Hey everyone, uh, my name is Eduardo Gomez. I'm here with Alejandro Machado. Uh, we are Venezuelans currently working to improve the crypto ecosystem and we wanted to talk today about a very important topic, which is money is the first dApp, crypto adoption in Venezuela. Living in Venezuela. So um, we, um, in Venezuela, there's a, a vibrant Bitcoin community, cryptocurrency community. And uh, we all been using cryptocurrencies since the start to survive incredibly hardships like hyperinflation. Infrastructure in Venezuela has worsened. Um, the country is in the middle of the worst economic crisis in the history, in its history. And uh, essentially everyone in the country is living on past glories. Like uh, we are now experiencing inflation rates of up to a million percent and uh, there's no public uh, expenditure on infrastructure in the country. We're seeing things like uh, uh, old abandoned towers, buildings that are being used by poor people to live in. This picture right here that you can see is a Tower of David. It's an unfinished building, a skyscraper, that was invaded by, by people to live in. This is the state of Venezuela right now. And that's uh, what we wanted to address here and raise awareness of. Poverty in Venezuela in five years has uh, tripled, doubled, and essentially now up to 90% of the population is living in poverty. The monthly minimum wage in Venezuela right now is about $5 per month of work. This, of course, has means that the whole population depends on the government. The government has made itself um, uh, basically uh, the, the, pan, the bank for the population. The, the population depends on the, on the government to give them handouts to survive because the wages are so low. Yeah, and they want it that way. Yeah, they want it. Legality does not equal morality. In Venezuela, there are laws and procedures that were put in place by the government that uh, the, 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 the National Assembly, the Congress, approved of them that seems like, like, like good things, but they're not. Uh, in Venezuela, there is uh, a state-sponsored violence. The country, uh, since the government cannot repress people, I mean, they repress people, but they cannot do so with the military or the police because it looks bad. What they have done is that they have sponsored their whole paramilitary guerrilla. The way they do this is that they have um, basically uh, put people uh, from a political party and they have uh, funded them, they have given them their arms, weapons, resources, and these guys show up at any dissident or any protest. So it is citizens repressing citizens that are, these citizens, the case, they're sponsored by the government. This is the exact thing that we're seeing right now in Nicaragua with Daniel Ortega. The paramilitaries are running the, are running the country there. We have been living this since 2000, approximately since 2012 or something. 15 years of exchange control. Venezuela is one of the few places in the world where you can exactly pinpoint where everything went to hell. In this case, it was in 2003 when former President Hugo Chavez, in a public speaking, he um, expressed his frustration in the fact that he could no longer fund public programs because the, the, the government had run out of money, the, the budget, right? So since he enjoyed tremendous popular support, the parliament there approved a law that could essentially allow the president to ask as much money as he wanted. These, uh, of course, put tremendous inflationary pressure into the economy because the, the, government, the government was printing money like crazy. Another part of this is that um, the government imposed the year after a currency control mechanism. This currency control mechanism means that regular citizens, Venezuela, Venezuelans, cannot buy dollars, euros, or any other currencies. Essentially, the people, the population, have to resort to a black market to get dollars if they need. Venez regular Venezuelans cannot access uh, these, uh, these uh, hard currencies. Yeah. And so the, uh, the, the, the control of, of, of the access to dollars, uh, the government has it. One of the, uh, one of the worst aspects of this is that 
the government has uh, infiltrated all public institutions, even private sector, because they're the ones who decides who gets the dollar. If you're a businessman in Venezuela and you want to invest in the country and you want to purchase dollars to import some goods, you have to go through the government and you need connections with the government. So this currency control mechanism has been used by the government since 2003 to seize power and to basically exert their influence all over the economy. Venezuelans, um, in, 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 in this scenario, they have to resort to the black market to get their dollars. In my case, crypto, uh, this is the story of how crypto made me thrive. Um, in 2015, I was basically seeking for ways to generate income online, get some work done, because minimum wage at the time was about $30 per month. Everyone, I was hearing stories of people playing games like World of Warcraft to mine gold, and they, they were selling that gold in, in, in the, on the internet, and they were making more money than engineers, programmers, um, normal employees inside the country. So after hearing all these stories, I decided, what the hell? Let's do some work on the internet. And I joined these platforms, things like Upwork, Freelancer, Fiverr, to do some work. Things like translation, content creation, etc. The problem with this is that these services, they rely on centralized payment systems like PayPal, Payoneer, and other gatekeepers of the uh, international, in this case, inter internet money world. And these platforms also take their cut. So I was getting 70% of, of the money by using Upwork or Freelancer. And then in Venezuela, I had to purchase a PayPal account because the currency control mechanism does not let me um, cash out those dollars into my currency. So I, have to, I had to buy a verified PayPal account. And then I had to, I was using a dealer to sell these dollars I was earning PayPal for significantly less. To put things into perspective and make, make it simple, I was, making like 40% less of my work, what I deserve, just by using these centralized service systems. So, I have done in this cryptocurrency space everything since solving CAPTCHAs, writing articles, and a bunch of other stuff. In, at the end of 2015, I joined, I, I stumbled upon Bitcoin Talk Forum, and I saw there, there was some guy who was paying people for solving CAPTCHAs, and he was paying with Bitcoin. He was paying 0 0.0015 Bitcoin per, per 1,000 CAPTCHAs, which equals to 150 Satoshis per CAPTCHA. This was, uh, at the time, was $1.65 per 1,000 CAPTCHAs, and I was making like 5,000 CAPTCHAs per month, uh, per, per day. Uh, yeah. And... Um, Tell me you huddled. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, these... Uh, this was a nice experience. I, I felt like I was throwing my, my life away, but it was a nice experience because I was earning Bitcoin, and Bitcoin was easily tradable in Venezuela. We had Sir Bitcoin Exchange, which was the main Bitcoin exchange in the country, which had instant fiat withdrawals, something that neither of you guys have, mm -hmm. uh, even in the US. <laughs> so, um, and there was also local Bitcoin, which was gaining popularity back then. So then this happened. I got wrecked by the secret police. So in Venezuela, there's the Sabine, which is basically the CIA and NSA combined in the country. They use this secret police not to protect their country against espionage or something. They use it as a political tool. They imprison political dissents and basically anyone who is against the government. This is a 2018 head Gestapo or Stasi or something. So. They detained me because I was doing stupid things in the internet and I stumbled upon an, an open FTP server of these guys with sensitive information, pictures of agents. They were doing some internal stuff and they left an open FTP server. This is the level of incompetence that we see <laughs> down there, yeah. And some of you may believe that this was a honeypot. No, this, was, this, this wasn't a honeypot. Mm -hmm. This was unintentionally left open. So. After a month of their stumble of that, that server, I got detained by them, they raided my house, and they took not only me inside the police station, but my mining rigs that I had for Ethereum. So uh, this was a very bad experience, as you might imagine. I, uh, luckily, I got out two weeks after that. I spent 15 days in jail, 
And, but they stole my mining equipment, and they never returned it. They're probably mining, still mining Ethereum by now, or Zcash, or whatever. Yeah. So um, luckily, um, about one month ago, um, this, this was all in 2016. At the end of it, I finally, at the, at, the, at the end of the year, I finally got a real job in the cryptocurrency scene. I now work for Purse.io as a customer support agent. I finally, be, uh, I was finally able to leave the country uh, last month. And since then, since then, I've been pretty much living cash uh, bankless in Venezuela. And in Argentina, I'm living, I'm living uh, basically um, with only Bitcoin. I have no bank account. And uh, it's relatively easy in, in these countries um, to exchange money. The problem with these countries is that, uh, gentlemen, there's, um, there, we have governments that have decided upon themselves to control every aspect of life. They, they control the issuance of money and they have no repairs into diluting or in, uh, increasing the monetary base which affects the whole population. So um, we are now, I'm now living uh, uh, pretty much on cash and Bitcoin in Argentina by using local Bitcoin. In Venezuela, sadly, Sir Bitcoin Exchange, which was, which was the biggest Bitcoin exchange, it got shut down by the government. So everyone there is now relying on local Bitcoin to make mm. their payments and to trade their Bitcoin. Yeah. I now want to leave this stage to Alejandro, who's going to talk about more initiatives that he's working on to improve this situation. And hopefully we can ex inspire some of you guys to build tools for uh, the people in Venezuela. Um, I can stay here if you want. Yeah. You want to intervene, you can also intervene. I can just stay here. Uh, yeah, we're very lucky to have you here and like to tell us your story. And we're really happy that you were able to make it out. Thank you. Uh, so here we are. This is DEF CON. We're super excited about the world computer and decentralized applications. We are talking about the things that these decentralized applications could enable. Money, identity, governance. The real state of things is that money is at beta stage, like 0.0, identity and governance, they're coming, but it's still very, very early. So what we're doing at the Open Money Initiative, we believe that access to a free and open financial system is a basic human right. And we are focusing on enabling people to get access to free money, to open money systems. We believe that decentralized applications will be enabled by the use of money first. So what can you do? as a Venezuelan uh, that is, doesn't have access to, to monetary uh, systems that are open, that doesn't have access to exchanging your worthless money into sound money. You can earn across borders. As uh, Eduardo said, you can mine. Uh, you can mine Ether. You can mine Zcash. I, I have friends who are doctors who are earning like $5 a month. If you can mine Zcash or Ether, if you have like an old rig at your house, you can earn 200 And that's a lifeline for m many, many people. Uh, we want to empower more people to get access to, to, to this. Uh, you can also earn across borders. And, uh, you know, Eduardo talked about this briefly as well. You can have uh, systems that where, where you can earn money by trading your labor for cryptocurrencies that then you can exchange for, for others. Uh, typically, the setup is you mine a coin or you earn in a coin and then you cash out to Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is the most liquid cryptocurrency in Venezuela, the local Bitcoin's volume is around a million dollars a day, and it's very easy to, if, if you know how to navigate the local Bitcoin's interface, which nobody, like, not, not everyone does, uh, but if you, if you do know how to, it's relatively, you, it's, it's almost like earning in foreign currency and being able to trade back and forth. So you, you are almost getting access to this uh, open financial system, uh, and uh, you can almost say that you are banked. You can also store your value, uh, because if you just keep the money in Bolivars, you are subject to 98% um, depreciation in, in the year or something like that. Uh, you can also defeat extortion. I have friends of friends who have crossed the border recently, and instead of getting harassed at the border and getting seized, they could just carry a password in their head. And when they cross the border, you, you don't have bills with you. Or you, have, you have some bills, and then they, they can just seize a part of that, but they can't seize what you have here or what you have in your phone if you protect it well. 
And we can provide unstoppable humanitarian aid. The government has a history of boycotting humanitarian aid because they believe that all aid is CIA agents that want to disrupt their operations, and they deny the extent of the humanitarian crisis. So if we're able to give people the tools, and 45% of Venezuelans own a smartphone, if we're able to give people the tools to store cryptocurrency and to get cryptocurrency into the hands of people, getting people that live outside Venezuela to send cryptocurrency to their families uh, that are earning in uh, Colombian pesos or in soles or in dollars, if we can get money that is sound money or, or real uh, tradable money into Venezuela and then they're able to use it as money, then uh, we can provide a lot of aid for the people that are still there. So what are we doing at the Open Money Initiative? We are creating campaigns for awareness and education. We have a wiki uh, that's in Spanish and English, and uh, we expect this to be the hub for Venezuelans to come and really learn about practical uses of cryptocurrency. We're not gonna explain how the blockchains work. We're not gonna explain you know, high-level concepts. Vitalik's papers are not gonna be here, probably. But what we want is for people to use like just products and services that are relatively simple. So we explain how to use Abra, how to use uh, some other wallets, and uh, how to gain access to this open financial system. Uh, we're focusing on usability, so we're developing some uh, wallets and some tools that people can use to uh, send, for example, DAI to each other uh, using things that they already use, like WhatsApp. We are experimenting with airdrops and onboarding in border uh, cities. We have like partners, uh, it's a project called Crypto Conserje, this is where, where they took this picture in Cucuta, and uh, they are experimenting with different ways that people can get paper wallets and, uh, and can pay with them and get used to the idea of cryptocurrencies. Um, and how can you help? So please, uh, first of all, live out your values. If you really believe in decentralization, you have to be aware that there's enemies to these decentralizations. There's people and states that don't really care much for freedom. And uh, just try to, try to be coherent with, with what you do. Um, Designed for those who need crypto today, and in this case, we believe that Venezuelans are very much uh, at the forefront of this. Argentinians also experience very high inflation. In Iran, they also experience high inflation. So just look out for those cases where money, like the need for money is really, really pressing. Think about privacy. Uh, privacy, don't, don't put stuff on the blockchain that you may regret putting. Uh, think really, really hard about privacy. Uh, Talk to the privacy experts, talk to the Zcash community, to the Monero community. Uh, and uh, Uport, for example, is a great uh, project that really, really cares about privacy. So talk to them. Uh, and then unlock talent by, by paying people in crypto. If, yeah. you, if you only are limited to paying in certain banks or, or certain countries, you're going to deny yourself from like, this huge pool of talent that lives in Venezuela and elsewhere that can earn money in crypto directly. Um, and then finally, support us. We are very lucky to come with the support of these organizations, especially shout, shout out to the Zcash company, which has supported us from the beginning. And uh, we are pressing forward with our research and our experiments. And please reach out to us here if you're still interested. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, let's have a couple questions. Woo, people all over the hood. Let's go the closest. Cause... Hey guys, um, first of all, thanks for, uh, you must be very courageous, uh, courageous to do what you're doing with the project and to stand here in front of the world and speak about it. Thank you. Um, my question is more along the lines of, I'm, I'm very interested to understand, the, uh, to get a picture of what it's like in Venezuela. Um, with all the challenges that you guys are facing, uh, does that mean that the market adoption are much higher? So the, the, the grandmothers, the kids, uh, do they know things about like how to use private keys, uh, how to make sure that their uh, wallet address is, is, a, is a private account and you, know, you don't want to share it so that people can see all of your balances? Uh, and just, I know, just generally a picture of market adoption. Yeah. Um, so adoption has still increased in the country. Um, sadly, we're not at the point where people are paying each other with crypto. Uh, adoption in Venezuela mostly means that people are using cryptocurrency to store the wealth. Um, to put an example of what I was doing, I was, I was getting paid directly in crypto, which I hope, and that was a point that we made before, I hope that more companies 
who pay the, their workers in crypto. I see a lot of you here, companies like Consensus, Coinbase. Uh, in, a lo in a lot of cases, these big companies don't pay their workers in crypto. They're unlocking themselves away from talent that are living in, this comp in these countries. They can get paid. So adoption in Venezuela looks like this. People are using cryptocurrency to restore the wealth, to freely transact. I use it uh, on a regular basis. What I was doing is uh, I was exchanging each week due to hyperinflation. I was exchanging Bitcoin each week into local currency to spend and uh, using, using local currency uh, Bolivars with a bank account. But like I said, I was exchanging it weekly, the, 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 the currency. Um, we are far away, very far away from massive adoption. What we need in Venezuela is easy to, easy to use uh, interfaces, apps, exchanges. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the bottleneck right now is that we only have one Bitcoin exchange, centralized Bitcoin exchange, which is local Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And there's the decentralized alternatives are still, are still very hard to use. Normal people don't want to think about all of that uh, stuff. So uh, th that's what we're hoping to see. Yeah, it's, it's also it's worth bearing in mind that adoption in Venezuela is probably at 1% or certainly less than 5% of the population are using cryptocurrencies. So to put everything into perspective, this is just very niche activity that we are just very lucky to be a part of. Uh, both me and Eduardo, we, we got into cryptocurrency and that we understand its benefits, but the majority of the population doesn't understand. When they think of cryptocurrency, they probably think of the petro scam that the government was trying to push. So we still don't know, or we, we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of public perception of cryptocurrency, in terms of awareness, in terms of, yes, it's, it's a bit about teaching people how to store private keys, maybe it's, it's about doing that a little bit as well, but also lowering the bar. Like, WhatsApp, I, th I think WhatsApp is my, my, my go-to example all the time because no one is, was sending encrypted messages before WhatsApp came around. And not, no one knows how WhatsApp really does it to like actually enc encrypt your message and, and it, it appears in, unencrypted on the other side. They manage the protocol. Like People don't care about protocols, people care about products. So if you design products that normal people can use, people will use them. So, great. Yeah, we're going to do just one more question, unfortunately, and then we're going to move on. And I, I made eye contact. With, oh, it was actually the person to your right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so you mentioned uh, a lot of um, sort of uh, philosophical challenges and people um, thinking more, you know, at those uh, fundamental levels. But are there any technical challenges that you feel, you know, if these are solved, that it's going to take things to the next level uh, for your kind of situation? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, technical challenges exist. First one is that, uh, well, Venezuela is relatively, uh, let's say, a small country. It's 30 million, um, 30 million inhabitants, minus like 3 million that recently left. And um, so... Uh, the, 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 I guess the, the, there's this project called the play, uh, uh, this project that has been uh, uh, developed by the Pale Blue Foundation. They want to do this big airdrop to Venezuelans. Um, they want to send millions of, of, of dollars in Bitcoin to Venezuelans. The, the technical challenge is to build wallets that are censorship resistant, resistant that can run on uh, very uh, poor hardware. So Venezuelans have old phones. We're talking about Android 4.0 um, phones. So the technical challenges are programming applications, uh, wallets that can run on these tiny few resources that yeah. Venezuelans have. And, and keeping stuff decentralized enough so that no one can really stop it and creating liquidity. This is not, it's more like an economic challenge rather than uh, a um, technical like computer science challenge. But as I said, I believe that money is at 0.0 uh, stage. It's, it's, it's beta. It's like an experimental uh, cancer treatment for someone who's like really ill. And it's something that we might as well try because there's no alternative. Like as some people say, oh, it's too early. Like people don't have access. Like crypto, crypto is still in a very early stage, but I, I really disagree because there's, there's really no other choice. There's, the way we, there's, this is the one shot that we have at trying to solve the problem in a way that is peaceful and that you know, gives people really access to, to monetary systems that are open. 
So, and, and people already put up with a lot of bureaucracy. If you want to send money into the country, you have to like basically give the birth certificate of your grandmother and a whole bunch of other requis like requisites to, to like be able to retrieve your money. And the, then the government ends up taking a 56% cut of what you send. So the bar is already so low. And it's just what the, my, my main point of this talk is that money is so broken in Venezuela that even if we don't have fully functioning money, it's going to work well enough for most people or better. So it's going to empower them.